Hey, everybody. It's Wednesday, March 10th. And as you can see here in the aim today, our goal for today's video is to talk about how we can use concepts of torque and rotational equilibrium to solve problems. Now, as I'm hoping you're aware, at least over the last couple of days, we've spent some time talking about torque and rotational equilibrium. And because torque is a huge component of this unit, in the same way that force is integral to the discussion of momentum and work, I really want to just take a beat here before we move on to make sure everybody has a really solid working understanding of torque before we get into some of the more bigger picture concepts associated with this unit. And so today is really all going to be about problem solving. If you go to the main post for today on Google Classroom, you will see a worksheet. That worksheet is entitled Rotational Motion, Torque and Rotational Dynamics Problem Set. And there are a bunch of questions on here. We're actually going to be working on these questions over two days. Honestly, these were three separate worksheets that I just decided to consolidate into one. So it would be a little easier to use in this online format. And so I want to go through these, at least for today, in order, just so we can see the kind of questions that you could be asked about rotational motion with regard to torque and rotational equilibrium and sort of, you know, get a better feel of how to explain the answers to these questions. And so the first one here is in this rotational motion, torque and rotational dynamics problem set. It's number one on the page. It, these are all from the Tipper's book. This is B6 CT10, fishing rod, weight of two pieces. It says an angler, which is really just an old timey word for fisher, if you, fisherman, if you didn't know that. Uh, it says an angler balances a fishing rod on her finger as shown. If she were to cut the rod along the dashed line with the weight of the piece on the left-hand side, be greater than, less than, or equal to the weight of the piece on the right-hand side. Explain your reasoning. Now, there's a lot of important information given to you in the text, which notice there's not much, and the picture. I want you to take a couple minutes to pause this video here and really think about the answer and the explanation. How can you use the information given to you in the text and the picture to come up with a coherent explanation of how the weights of the piece on the left-hand side and the right-hand side of that dashed line compare. And when you hit play, we'll go over it. Okay, so I'm just gonna go ahead here and show the explanation. I'll let you copy whatever parts of that you may need to copy down, and then I'll come back to the diagram and explain it before we move on. The answer here, notice the question says, would the weight of the piece on the left-hand side be, the weight of the piece on the left-hand side would be greater than the piece on the right-hand side. In order for the fishing rod to balance, the rod needs to be in rotational equilibrium which means the torques acting on each side of the rod need to cancel each other out. That's an important piece of information that was given to you in the text. Whenever they're telling you that something is balancing, that's an essential piece of information because it's telling you that the thing is in rotational equilibrium. And that really is the key to answering the question. Why is it the key to answering the question? Well, as I go on to say here, on each side, the force causing the torque needs to act on the center of mass and the torques ultimately need to cancel. And so since the right side of the rod is much longer, the distance from the center of mass to the pivot point is much larger, this is true on the right side, than the distance from the center of mass on the left side to the pivot point. The pivot point here is where her finger was, where that dashed line was. Since the distance from the pivot point on the right side is larger and the torque is directly proportional to the product of the distance from the pivot point and the force, which is the weight here, then the weight of the rod on the left side must be larger to produce the same torque. Take a minute to pause this video here and write this down, adding any parts of this that may be missing from your explanation. And when you hit play, like I said, I'll go back to that picture and try to explain it one more time. 
Okay, so the whole point of this discussion that we had at the end of the momentum unit on extended objects is that what we refer to as extended objects have a center of mass. And so if we're looking at the right-hand side of the fishing rod, we can see that this is a pretty long piece, and the piece is tapered, meaning it gets skinnier at the end. And so it is probably true that the center of mass is a little closer to the left than the middle, simply because there's less material down here at the right end. For this piece, the left piece, the piece to the left of this dashed line, the center of mass is probably right there. I don't know if you've ever used a fishing rod before, but this part where all the, the fishing line is spooled up is pretty heavy. So the point here is the center of mass is the location where the force of gravity acts. And I'm not drawing these to scale. I'm just kind of making them long enough so that there's nothing else in the way when I write the symbol FG. And essentially what we're saying here is that the position vector R, which I guess I'll call this R2 and I'll call that FG2, and the weight ultimately determine the magnitude of the torque. Because the torques, remember, have to be equal. And if we just actually write out the equation R1 F1 sine theta 1 equals R2 F2 sine theta 2, we realize first that the force is perpendicular to the position vector. And that's always going to be the case, for the most part at least, when we're talking about weights. And so ultimately, for rotational equilibrium problems, a lot of the time, the equation is going to boil down to rmg equals rmg. And of course, because there's a g on each side of the equation, they cancel. So really, it's ultimately determined by the distance from the pivot point and the mass. And so the idea is, because the center of mass here, the location where the force of gravity is acting is so much farther from the line over here on the right side, the mass of the left side has to be bigger because when you multiply this bigger number times the littler, the littler, the smaller r, you're going to end up getting the same size torque. It's important to realize that that really does make sense if you look at the picture, because that's why in order to make the thing balance, her finger has to be so much closer to the left side of the rod than the right side of the rod, because that's the side that's heavier. So you need to minimize the r really, because the mass is so much bigger, in order to make the torques the same. That's the idea. It's important to realize, like, if we take a ruler and we try to balance it on our finger, we're going to put our finger at exactly the six-inch mark if it's a foot-long ruler. And that's because the, the mass is uniformly distributed throughout the ruler. However, if one side of the ruler had quarters taped to it, the weight on that side is larger, and so you would see the ruler rotate to that side. And so what you need to do to compensate for the fact that there's more weight on that side of the ruler, if we have quarters stacked up on that side of the ruler, is instead of putting your finger at the six-inch mark to make it balance, you'd have to put it somewhere over here so that the increased mass, coupled with the smaller distance, ends up giving you the same size torque as the increased distance with the smaller mass on the other side. And that's the idea. These rotational equilibrium problems are always gonna work out to the distance times the mass on one side needing to be equal to the distance times the mass on the other side. With that, let's move on to the second problem. The second problem is right below the first problem on this worksheet. It's still on the first side of the the first page there in that attachment. This one is B6RT12, and it says four forces acting on a hexagon, torque about center. And it says four forces act on a plywood hexagon as shown in the diagram. The sides of the hexagon each have a length of one meter. And the question says, rank the magnitude of the torque applied about the center of the hexagon by each force. Now, I just want to say one thing before I have you do this problem. If you remember, in one of the previous videos, I wrote a note which said something to the effect of, you could calculate the torque about any point 
in general, you should choose the point that is most obvious unless they specifically tell you which point to use. And it's important to realize here in this one, they tell you which point to use. In this particular problem, they're telling you here to calculate the torque or, or to rank the torque at least about the center. So effectively, you can imagine this thing is rotating about that axis. We can imagine a long pole sticking out of the page and into the page, and this thing is going to rotate either clockwise or counterclockwise. Take a second to pause this video here and rank the torques about the center of the hexagon for each of these four forces. And when you hit play, we'll go over it. Okay, perhaps to some of you, this was obvious, but if it was not, even if it was seemingly obvious to you, I highly suggest you do this. I personally do this myself. I do think it is a really smart idea when you're doing these torque problems to draw the position vector. Because if you draw the position vector, it just makes it a little more obvious. I guess I'll do this in red. If we draw the position vector for force A here, and I'll just label that RA, we can see here that the force is perpendicular to this position vector. If we do it for C, and I'll label this RC, we can see that the force is not perpendicular to the position vector, but rather is at some angle that's greater than 90 degrees. However, for D and B, the force is exactly parallel to the position vector. And that tells you every single thing that you need to know about the torque, because remember, the torque is equal to R F sine theta. And what you should realize is that the R, the length of the position vector for all of them is the same. The forces, as you can see, have different magnitudes. They're all four newtons, except for this one. This one is six newtons. And so ultimately, this is gonna come down to the size of the force and the angle. And so what I wrote here was, according to the equation for torque, which is tau equals RF sine theta, the torque is maximized when the force acting is the largest, when that force acts at the largest distance from the pivot point, and the force acts perpendicular to the moment arm, which is another fancy name we give the position vector. I'm going to start to drop this every now and then just so you get familiar with that language because that's something that is used to describe that position vector. Sometimes they call that the moment arm. And so I wrote here, the torque produced by A is the largest because it is produced by the largest perpendicular force. The force C produced less torque than A because it is not perpendicular to the position vector, but it's also not parallel. And that judgment is pretty easy to make because the torque produced by B and D are both zero because the forces are parallel to the position vector and thus produce no torque. And so that means the ranking here for this one was A is greater than C is greater than B is equal to D. Take a second to pause this video here and write that down. And when you hit play, we'll move on to the next one. Moving on to the next one, next problem on the sheet, this should be on the uh, back side of the sheet or the top of the second page, I guess, because it's all a PDF. This one is B6QRT13, balance beam, motion after release. It says five identical keys are suspended from a balance, which is held horizontally as shown. The two keys on the left are attached to the balance six centimeters from the pivot, and the three keys on the right are attached five centimeters from the pivot. What will happen when the person lets go of the balance beam? Explain. It's an interesting little question. Take a couple minutes here to pause this video and really try to work out the answer. What is the reasoning? What's the explanation? And when you hit play, we'll go over it. So as we've mentioned so far, and I think we've kind of beat this point into the ground so far, but if you're not quite with it yet, then it should be noted that the torque is going to be equal to RF sine theta. That much should be clear to everybody by now. And because, once again, this is a problem where the torque is caused by gravity, the force 
is going to be perpendicular to the position vector or the moment arm. And so that means the angle is going to be 90 and the sine of 90 is 1. And so ultimately, the torque produced by either set of keys is going to be R times M times G because the torque is produced by the force of gravity. And so once again, that means we need to have torque 1 equal torque 2. And so that means R1 M1, where M1 is the mass of all the keys, needs to equal R2 M2 where M2 is the mass of all the keys. And so ultimately here, once again, this comes down to the size of the masses and how those masses are distributed within the system. And so ultimately here, the answer is that the balance beam will experience a clockwise rotation. What I wrote here is when the person lets go of the balance beam, what will happen is ultimately determined by the direction of the net torque, which is determined by the mass and their location with respect to the pivot point. The mass, and thus the weight, which is the force here in the torque equation, on the right-hand side is 1.5 times larger on the right-hand side compared to the weight on the left-hand side. Now, that explanation goes on and continues, but I want to just stop there. There are two ways you can go about doing this. You could say that each of the keys has a certain amount of mass and go from there. But the problem tells you, if you noticed, that these are five identical keys. And so ultimately, I have three keys worth of mass on the right-hand side and two keys worth of mass on the left-hand side. And three over two is 1.5. That ultimately is how that reasoning is worked out. So what I said here is the mass on the right side is one and a half times larger than the mass on the left side. But the mass is only 1.2 times farther away from the pivot point on the left-hand side. It should be noted here that if the ultimate governing equation is R1M1 equals R2M2, then ultimately this has to do with how the ratios work out because you should be able to imagine a scenario where the mass on one side is two times as large, but the distance on that side is half as large. And in that case, then ultimately the torques will be equal. They'll cancel. Here, because the mass on the right-hand side is 1.5 times larger, but the distance on the left side is only 1.2 times larger, them placing those keys farther away is not enough to compensate for how much heavier the keys on the right side are. And so the idea is the torque produced by the keys on the right side will be larger than the keys on the left, which will produce a torque which is into the page and thus will produce a clockwise rotation of the beam. Take a second to pause this video here and write that down. And when you hit play, we'll move on. All right, moving on, we'll take a little bit of a respite here because this one is a little simple. B6RT21, hanging weights on fixed disks, torque. It says here, vertically oriented circular disks have strings wrapped around them. The other ends of the strings are attached to hanging masses. The diameters of the disks, the masses of the disks, and the masses of the hanging masses are given. The disks are fixed and not free to rotate. Specific values of the variables are given in the figures. And so you can see here the values of all these variables are given. It says here, rank the magnitudes of the torques exerted by the strings about the center of the disks. And then explain your reasoning. I'd like you to take a couple minutes here, pause this video, and rank the magnitudes of the torques. And when you hit play, we'll go over it. Okay, so as you should know already, because we've said this many, many times in this video now, the torque is equal to RF sine theta. And because this is a torque produced by gravity here, uh, the sine of the angle is going to be 1 because the angle is 90. And so that means here... The torque is going to be calculated by the equation RMG. Now, because the torque is directly proportional to the distance, 
we can start with the larger distances and then ultimately see how the masses are going to affect those torques. And so the largest distances are A and D. Those both are involving these masses applying their torque 10 centimeters away from the pivot point here. And so to compare the magnitudes of the torques, we just need to compare the magnitudes of the masses. And if you notice here, the 800 gram mass is significantly larger than the 500 gram mass. And so that's going to produce the largest torque. So we have D, then A. And I think always when you're doing this, you should take a beat to just say, well, wait a second. C also is involving a 500 gram mass. So are we really sure A is producing a larger torque than C? And the answer is yes, because this 500 gram mass is applying its torque only five centimeters away from the pivot point. And so because it's half the distance, it's actually going to end up being half the torque. And so we can put here uh, C, and then of course B by default would be least, but we just want to make sure we check on that. Is this going to give you the least torque? Well, the answer is yes, because it is the same distance as C, but the mass is significantly smaller. And according to this equation too, the torque is directly proportional to the mass. And so we have here D, A, C, and B as our ranking. And the explanation is the torques produced by the hanging weights is dependent on the distance of the weight from the pivot point, which in this case is the center of the disk, and the magnitude of the weight of the objects, which is directly proportional to their mass. This, of course, is given by the equation tau equals rf sine theta, which is rmg, once you recognize that the force is the weight and that force is perpendicular to the moment arm. The torque is directly proportional to the mass and directly proportional to the center of the disk, and so the ranking works out as we just said. There's not really a whole lot else that could be written for this explanation. Take a second to pause this video here and write that down, and when you hit play, we'll move on. All right, and lastly, before we go for today, I just want to take a look at one more problem, which has a large number of parts. If you look at number five on the torque and rotational dynamics problem set, you'll see a long multi-part problem. This question, B6LMCT20, uh, is a question about a pivoted board with a load, and it's talking about the force that's required to hold the board. It says here, 100 Newton weight is placed on a massless board, a distance of L1 to the left of a frictionless pin. A vertical downward force is applied to the other side of the board, a distance L2 from the pin as shown. The system is at rest. It says here, identify from the choices one through five how each change described below will affect the magnitude of the applied force F on the right side of the board needed to keep the system in equilibrium. And notice here, if you go down the list, there are a bunch of different parts to this problem. I actually only want to talk about four right now. I think, like, obviously we could do all of them, but I think it's just going to get redundant to do so many of them. So I just want to focus on four of them. And those are A, B, D, and E. And so we'll start with part A. As you can see here uh, at the very bottom of this slide, it says here, Part A, the 100 Newton weight is moved to a position closer to the pin. In other words, they decrease the distance L1. If they decrease the distance L1, remember the question is identify how each change described below. So identify how moving the 100 Newton weight closer to the pin will affect the magnitude of the applied force F on the right side of the board needed to keep the system in equilibrium. Take a couple minutes to pause this video here and work out an answer and an explanation. Notice on the worksheet, there's not a ton of room on the sheet. You are not expected to write like a, a whole paragraph, but just come up with a basic answer, a basic explanation. And when you do so, hit play and we'll go over it. Okay, so the answer here is two. Moving the 100 Newton weight closer to the pin would decrease the magnitude of the support force on the board, but not to zero. Moving the 100 Newton weight closer to the fulcrum will cause the weight to produce less torque out of the page. That torque is out of the page 
because it would cause a counterclockwise rotation. Since the torque is directly proportional to the distance from the pivot point, right? So if the distance to the pivot point uh, gets smaller, the torque gets smaller. In order to compensate by producing less torque into the page, the magnitude of the support force must be decreased. So if you have less torque out of the page from moving the weight, you got to have less torque into the page. And the only way you can do that is by decreasing the size of the force. Of course, you could move the support force closer to the fulcrum, but that's not an option. Uh, and so our only option out of the ones given is to decrease the magnitude of the support force. Take a minute to pause this video here and write that down. And when you hit play, we'll move on. All right, moving on to part B. Same situation, same setup. Now we're asked to consider what happens when the support force is moved to a position closer to the pin. Take a second to pause this video here and come up with an answer and an explanation. And when you do, hit play and we'll go over it. The answer here is that this would require you to increase the magnitude of the support force on the board. If the support force is moved closer to the fulcrum, the decreased distance from the pivot point will cause the torque produced by the support force to decrease as the torque is directly proportional to the distance from the pivot point. In order to maintain the same amount of torque though, because remember, we have to keep this thing in rotational equilibrium, the magnitude of the support force must be increased to maintain the same amount of torque. That's the idea. It's pretty straightforward. Rotational equilibrium requires the torques to cancel each other out. Here, it's only really dependent on the size of the force and the distance from the pivot point. And that's it. Take a second to pause this video here and write that down. And when you hit play, we'll move on to the next part. All right, moving on to part D here. Part D is asking you to consider what happens when the support force is moved to the right end of the board. Take a minute to pause this video here and answer this question, come up with an answer, come up with an explanation. And when you hit play, we'll go over it. The answer to this part here is to decrease the magnitude of the support force on the board, but not to zero. If the force is moved to the end of the board, then the torque produced into the page by that force increases as the torque is directly proportional to the distance from the fulcrum. In order to decrease the torque back to its original value, so the system maintains rotational equilibrium, the magnitude of the support force needs to be decreased. That's the idea. It's always an interplay here between the size of the force and the distance from the fulcrum. And as I hope you realize here now, you can probably see why we are not doing all these problems because as we go through a few examples, you can see this really starts to get redundant. Take a minute to pause this video here and write this down. We'll take a look at one more and then we'll wrap it up for today. Last problem, part E. Part E is asking you to consider the change when the board is made longer, but the support force remains at the same location. And you're being asked to explain your reasoning. So take a minute to pause this video here and answer this question, come up with an answer, come up with an explanation. And when you hit play, we'll go over it. Okay, the answer here is four it will have no effect on the magnitude of the support force on the board. The magnitude of the torque is based on the magnitude of the force and the distance from the fulcrum. Since changing the length of the board doesn't change the magnitude of the force or the distance at which the force is applied relative to the fulcrum, the magnitude of the torque doesn't change. Now, I do want to write here, just very briefly, this is only true because the board is massless. If the length of the board on the left side and the right side were increased equally and the board had a significant amount of mass, then it still wouldn't matter. But if we increased the length of one side and not the other side, and the board had a significant amount of mass, then there would be a torque produced by gravity on the board, which would cause it to naturally 
swing down in a clockwise fashion. Because the board is massless, that doesn't matter, and there is no overall effect. Take a second to pause this video here and write that down. And when you hit play, we'll wrap it up for today. All right, with that, that'll be it for today. As you can see, there are some more questions in this problem set, but we will save these questions for another day. The amount that we've done today, I think, is sufficient. And when we have our next new video, we will talk about the remainder of these questions and then begin to discuss another topic. All right, everybody. Have a good one.